It's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a weekly podcast about comics, the comic book industry, and other geek pop culture. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. And now, on with the show! Hey everybody! It's the Fellowship of the Geeks podcast. My name is Thomas Chick, and joining me for this episode is Mike Marlowe. Hey, gang. And Les Webster. Hello. How are you guys doing? As well as can be expected. Hmm. Doing okie doke. Hope everybody's doing okay out there. So, what's been going on in your corner of the galaxy? Um, well. I'm sort of still at the tail end of getting over what I had the problem I had last week, so I'll talk about what I've been reading lately, which has been I've met, I actually mentioned it in passing last week the uh, the book Monty Python Speaks. Um, I'm close enough to done with it now that I think I'm willing to talk about it, and I am really enjoying it because it is almost the one thing we've learned not to expect in a book about Monty Python which is them actually talking seriously about stuff. I mean, you don't you don't have to get very far into their stuff to realize that they're pretty much going to be smart asses whenever they start talking about themselves. Mhm. But in this book, and this is not like this is not new. This is this came out years and years ago. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly when. But they they're actually taking it seriously. They're answering questions and they're talking about for example, their working relationships and they're talking about how the show came about and they're talking about how each of the films came about and how the process of writing them and shooting them went and going into quite a bit of detail. And it's it talks to other people, too. I mean, they're talking to some of the producers of the films and they even talk to some of the people from back in the Flying Circus days, some of the support staff and some people from the BBC and it's there's a lot of really cool information in there if you're geeky enough to process it all it's I'm I'm kind of getting a good sense of what it's like to or what it was like back then anyway to make a TV show at the BBC in the late 60s and early 70s and they talk quite a bit about how little they knew about making films and honestly how little most of them still know and it, there's just, yeah, it's 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 cool to kind of get a sense of their voices as people rather than the personas they portray with the, the Python thing. I guess maybe they're far enough removed from it now that yeah. it's easier for them to kind of just be themselves rather than trying to be the zany madcap Python group because they kind of almost weren't that at the beginning anyway. And that kind of came on later. I guess they did enough press stuff and and touring and shit like that that they kind of got caught up in that a little bit. And now they've been out of it long enough that they've kind of, I don't know, gotten some perspective on it. So it's just, there's some really interesting stuff in there. I highly recommend it. Sounds good. How about you, Les? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it sounds pretty straightforward. And it does sound like them sitting and just talking with you. Yep. It's pretty nice. Yep. All right, Les, how about you? I really got a big bag of nothing here. Uh, nothing special happened this weekend, and I stayed out of the hospital, so I guess I'm okay. I, you know, just the typical read when I can type stuff. So nothing in great particular. I thought you went to a playoff game this weekend. Oh, that is true. Yeah, I went to a, a championship game for arena football for the one of the local teams here. And it was exciting. Although, as Thomas knows, I was in a frantic mode to get there. <laughs> 
be in the middle of playing dice masters and get the phone call. So, yes, you did scare some people the way you kind of up and left. And I was like, no, no, this is important. This is important. <laughs> yeah, but I, I got there before the second half. I, I got there in the second quarter. So I got to uh, watch the majority of the game. Cool. Now, did you not know about the game, or did you not have tickets until then? I have tickets as part of our season ticket package. The thing is, they had scheduled, they had posted the schedule as being Saturday night and decided, oh, we're going to play on Friday night. (laughs) Nice. And Mike, the problem, part of the problem there is that they had played Monday night to get to this game. And I thought, well, you know, they should have a little extra time to try to get ready for this. But no, they went on a very short week. But they prevailed. Oh, cool. Is this like a national championship thing or is it like a regional deal or what? It was uh, a the league championship. It's a... Uh, Champions Indoor Football League, and this was the title game. Okay, so it was like the whole shebang. Cool. Remind me, Les, uh, this league is mainly Texas teams, but there are some that are out state. Like, uh, isn't there some like in Oklahoma and uh, wasn't there a couple other states too? Or am I remembering wrong? No, you're right. Uh, you've got uh, teams in Kansas. Okay, Kansas. And, I was I thought about Kansas, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, uh, in Wichita, and you've got teams in uh, South Dakota, Nebraska. So it's mainly the Plains states, but uh, I think there are three teams, four teams in Texas. Uh, and uh, that almost makes up the southern half of the conference. And then the, the northern teams, uh, which the uh, local team that we attend does not play during the regular season, which I still have not figured out. I figured that they would want to play one or two up north and, instead of playing the same teams down here three and four times. But that's the way they schedule. Well, and I'm sure it gets expensive to transport them and equipment and all that. True. And because uh, the Revolution won on Monday night, they had the best record, so it was decided they would play at Allen Friday night. And the team that came in is from Omaha, so they had a, a long haul to get here. Cool. Well, congrats. Um, yeah, definitely. Oh, thanks. It's fun. What were you doing, Thomas? Uh, not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, I had picked up another trade, and I was I've been re- reading that it was um. Oh God, I'm blanking. I've been reading so much. <laughs> just just for doing reviews and stuff. I know I was finishing up the Warlock trade that I mentioned from the pre- previous week. Oh, it was the uh, the Legion of Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. Oh uh, yeah, that which, was one of your picks, not long ago. Yeah, that was yeah that was one of my picks, which uh, collected several issues from oh mid to late seventies, which was about the time that I first got into reading the books. And I think for the very first time reprinted the, well, I mean, most of that stuff was reprinted for the first time, but it also included the story of uh, Lightning Lad and Saturn Girl getting married, which was originally uh, published in a Treasury edition. So it was kind of cool going back and revisiting some of those stories that I've not read in forever. So there's that. Also... Uh, as you listeners have no doubt remember 
Mikey and I spending some time on Twitch watching certain streamers and certain games and stuff. I've actually been watching a little MST3000 yeah, on Twitch. Yeah, I heard about, oh, I, I, actually, yeah, I was going to say, I heard about the day, but that was from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Shout Factory TV is, was celebrating the fact that they have a Twitch stream by doing a marathon of Mystery Science Theater 2000. And, of course, by the, unfortunately, by the time this drops, it's going to be pretty much over, but I'd still recommend going over to twitch.tv and just doing a search for Shout Factory and You'll have to set up an account, but it's free. Sign up for an account and follow them, and you'll get notifications whenever they stream episodes, which I'm sure they'll be doing that just like um, they've been doing marathons for Mr. Rogers and Bob Ross Ross and and other stuff. So it's been fun. It's kind of nice seeing some of the older episodes that you just don't see that often. I I saw one today and Les saw some of it too. That was one of the uh, really early ones where it was before TV's Frank had joined the cast. It was Dr. Earhart along with Dr. Forrester. So you also had the guy who played him also doing the voice of Tom Servo. So it was kind of interesting to go back to hear that voice again after Kevin Murphy be doing doing the voice for so many years, so it's been enjoyable. Cool, and I'll tell you, I don't know if you know about this, but there is a network called Comet that we have picked up because we're not, I don't have cable or anything, but we've right. got an antenna, and we've picked it up on the antenna because they have one of the channels is is broadcasting them like way up high in the what you used what you used to call the UHF channels. Um, it's one of the alternates, and they're they're basic. They basically show old sci-fi movies, and they've been show. I've seen it. I've I've flipped past MST3K on there as well. At uh, times. yeah, I've heard of Comet. Um, we've actually streamed it a couple of times up at the store. I haven't really messed around with it too much. But I've I've heard about it and it seems pretty cool. I definitely want to check it out. A lot more sci fi than the sci fi channel, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like they just recently picked up Stargate SG one too, so speaking of the yeah. channel. Woohoo. Yeah, I'm looking at the schedule now and I'm Looks pretty cool. Nice, some nice movies here. Although they got disturbing behavior, I don't exactly call that sci-fi, but okay. Uh, well, they were also showing one of the Halloween movies not too long ago. Ooh, Galaxina! Wow, I hadn't seen that in forever. Yeah, there's probably a reason for that. Yeah, um, Doctor Who and Daleks. Bring back some good memories there, uh, Les. Oh, yes. <laughs> and how about this one? The 1980 classic Flash Gordon. Ooh. Never heard of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Denial is a powerful force. Uh, it, the terror from beyond space. Oh, wow. Mad Max. And Mad Max. Maroon. Although I prefer the MST3K version of Maroon, but hey, Motel Hell and Once Bitten. Was Motel Hell with Rory Calhoun? Rory Calhoun and Nancy Parsons. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of... Straight out of the 80s. That's kind of surprising, isn't it, Les? Rory Calhoun doing, doing a horror film like that. Yes. After all those westerns. Yeah, I was about to say for those who are not familiar, I mean he's he's known for a ton of westerns. 
and he's he's very likable in the film because I, I I I don't want to say I've seen it real recently, but it's within the last few years. I wouldn't mind trying to check it out again. But yeah, uh, Nancy Parsons plays his sister, and for those who are not familiar with her, she was she was in the Porky's film. She was the uh, the gym teacher. Miss Ballbreaker. Ball brick, but Miss Ballbreaker. That's exactly it. <laughs> so. Some very interesting films. So you got Once Bitten. The Terror. The, vi- the Terror. Yeah. Sugar Hill. Okay, I hadn't heard of that one. The Curse. The Secret of Dim. There you go. Very nice. It's very interesting and cool films. Yep. And what is this site again? Comet TV. Uh, we might as well put a link in the, in the show notes. Just yeah, so, so point, everybody I think we have out. to. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So, cool. We're willing to take a sponsorship since we've already Sure, done. why not? <laughs> we've gone that far. And speaking of sponsors, nice segue there. Oh, sweet. Ooh. Spend a couple minutes uh, thanking our sponsors for their support. First off, want to uh, thank Peter Smeddy of Alterna Comics and the fine folks of Make Mine Indie, the digital catalog of uh, independent comics. A great selection of print, digital, and web comics that you're, you won't be able to find elsewhere except for in this catalog. The summer catalog is now out. It's 147 pages. It's full of previews, reviews, interviews, some a lot of good tidbits about uh, books that are out there. Some of these, Mikey and I have already done some reviews for, and and there's some out there that we would love to do reviews for. So, if you go to our website, www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. Click on our sponsors page. First thing you'll see is the logo for Make Mine Indie. Uh, there is a link there where you can get a free catalog, either as a CBZ or a PDF format. I uh, highly recommend you uh, doing that and checking it out. And most of these are going to be only available at these particular publishers' websites, which all that information will be there in the catalog. And you know what? You check something out and you think it's really cool or whatever, let us know. Shoot us a line and see what you think and let us know that, that you checked this out. So we want to thank them for their support. And we also want to thank the fine folks from Things from Another World for their support. Uh, they're running some awesome deals right now. Until July 6th, you can save up to 30% off select Wonder Woman products. Of course, just in time for the very successful movie. Uh, so there's some great deals there. Uh, of course, there, there's also a sale on uh, select Game of Thrones products, and that's good until July 16th. And there's also their evergreen deals of uh, 40% off select comics, statues, toys, and merchandise, 30% off pre-order manga titles, and... 50% off Nick and Dent comics and graphic novels. So while you're on our sponsors page, just scroll down to the bottom. There will be all the information and latest deals from things from another world. And you see a couple images there. If you click on those, that lets them know that uh, we sent you their way and take advantage of some of these great deals that are going on. All righty. For this week, um, just in time for the holiday, and let's go ahead and be the first to say uh, a happy July 4th for those who do celebrate it. I uh, hope everybody has a fun and safe holiday weekend, long weekend, or just a day off or whatever. But uh, I was kind of thinking about what we were going to talk about for this week. And I was reminded from one of the social media reminders, you know, hey, 
a year ago this happened and two years ago this happened, that kind of thing. I was reminded about how the first Captain America film was presented in certain countries. And if you remember, the first Captain America movie was called Captain America, the first Avenger. Well, in some countries, it was not called Captain America. It was just simply the first Avenger. And I was kind of reminded, I was like, well, I wonder how a book and a character such as Captain America would sell in another country. I know, I know in the UK they do the weekly books and I don't recall seeing anything being offered with, I mean, a Captain America would be on the cover, whether it be his solo stories or his Avengers, but it wasn't a Captain America book. It was usually, uh, it could be anything from a, a Spider-Man or Incredible Hulk or just a generic Marvel something something title. So I kind of threw it to the guys and said, hey, let's kind of go with this a little bit and, and, and figure how do patriotic characters or books in general, uh, book, comics in general or books, whatever we want to, do we think that they would, would they do well in another country? So, um, anyone want to lead off? Uh, step up. Okay. I can see where other countries would not be interested in some of the U.S. characters. You've got enough characters here that run a gamut of uh, nations, yet somebody that is as particular as a Captain America or someone that is wrapped in the U.S. flag, whether it be him or another character, would not probably be as engaging as, uh, we'll say, Spider-Man. I know Spider-Man is released in Mexico, as well as France, Great Britain, and some others. I don't see that a patriotic, a U.S. patriotic character is going to be a seller in other nations. Although a lot of them, a lot of the stories for Captain America and such, don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but they don't push an agenda of him fighting other nationalities. If the character he's battling, we'll say Batrock, who was French, I don't see that it's a reason that it would not sell in France. If something like that happened today, though, I've got a feeling that there are a lot of nations that would be uh, jilted. They would not prefer the way that their country or countrymen are being portrayed. I know it's a kind of a piece, way, but uh, I can see where it would not be appealing to them to face something like this. I, I, am I making sense or am I rambling? I'm, I'm rambling, but... Well, that's all we ever do is ramble on this show. Shit. Pretty much. <laughs> No, I, I agree, and I think that part of that is that it's not like we've got Captain America going up against France's big hero. I mean, because it's not, I mean, it's not a nation versus nation thing, generally speaking, especially now, and we'll get into the, the past stuff later, but you're, it's not like... Captain America is, and we're gonna, we're sorry, Marvel, we're gonna pick on Captain America a little bit in this one because he's clearly the most obvious choice here. Right. Um, it's not like Captain America is fighting Captain France, and Captain France is their big hero that everybody in France loves, and it's all, they're all, 
big Captain France fans, and we've got Captain America in our books just beating the tar out of him. We're not doing that. We're not going to do that, and that's crazy. But, I mean, with Batroc, for example, he's clearly a villain. And it, it, so, yeah, Captain America is going to – and it's usually just – it's not like he's going to be the big bad for a long period of time either. He's – I don't want to say he's a small-time villain, but he's not a huge villain, and he's not the guy – that rep that's going to really represent France as a political entity in in literature anywhere in the world. So I mean I don't yeah that's kind of a funny thing there. But I mean and there have been times in the past that we have done stuff like that, and usually those thing, those things are very much frowned on now, and stuff that I mean comics that came out during World War II, for example, there's no way in current society we could ever rationalize publishing something like that today. Most publishers are hesitant to even reprint that stuff. And sometimes when they do, they'll edit the crap out of it to just to try to make it somewhat reasonable. Um, and there are other things, other ways that that goes, but... That's not what we're talking about now. Either they will edit it, or there may be like a disclaimer. Oh, yeah. It's kind of a little bit of a sidetrack, but it's kind of the same mentality. Is I know there's a collection of cartoons that have been put on, on DVD. They're from back that time. And, and it starts off with a disclaimer because of some of the... Some of the just portrayals of personalities, let's, whether it's... Let's, let's not put too fine a point on it. There's some hardcore right. racist shit going on back in some of those cartoons because I've got I, I've got yes. some of the, the Looney Tunes collections. And yeah, they disclaimer the hell out of those things because holy cow, some of yeah. the stuff they did back then that they just thought that was okay. And I mean, back then, given the society as it was back then, it kind of was to an extent. Right. But, yeah, there's no. no way they could ever get away with that now. Oh, and God, so, no. And so, yeah, I mean, they, they've been edited over the years, and they finally, I mean, even some of the in some of those collections that I've got, some of those are still edited. I mean, they've kind of removed some of the edits to kind of give us a more complete sense of what the story was and what was originally published, and there's some of them they just can't even do that with because they're so bad. And they just don't even put them on the collections. It's just, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of funny to think about. I, I think we've we might have mentioned it. I don't know how re, we might have mentioned it recently. I'm trying to remember. But uh, a, a perfect example is Captain Canuck. I've always been told that Canuck is not exactly an endearing term. But the fact that that they're, I don't want to say it's their number one character, but I would say it's probably the most visible character that's not from the big two. Is a it has a has a code name that's somewhat derogatory. But then again, there's also a hockey team with that with that name too. But so, but then again, there's been all the. You know, there's been there's been the complaints about the, the I don't want to get into sports teams because all of a sudden that's going to open up <laughs> that's going to just open up some other doors and I don't that's stuff that we don't think we want to get into but but y'all you see what I'm talking about yeah it, and I I think you're right I think some of that stuff is relevant yeah I mean here in the states we've got the Washington Redskins and a lot of complaining and honestly legal action about how that's not a nice term, really. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we won't pursue that whole... Or if we if we were going to, we could do a whole show on it, but I doubt we really yeah. will. But, no. It, yeah, and it's, it's, it's... I think ultimately where this, this track of the conversation goes is perception. A lot of this stuff is based on essentially what other countries, how other countries perceive the United States. 
And yeah, this is this is one of those topics that could get real political real fast. But essentially, you're not you're certainly not going to see Captain America in countries that don't like the U.S. And whether that's from a strictly political standpoint, or it's just a their the general kind of consensus and outlook on the world, there are countries out there that don't like the U.S. And yeah, they're not going to pu- try to publish a Captain America comic. That's just going to be stupid. And in the countries that do, that in the, it, they're still you're still going to have variations and fluctuations in kind of the general opinion of the U.S. I mean, like right now, for example, the U.S. doesn't really have a great reputation currently. Um, There are a lot of people thinking, man, what are those idiots doing over there? And so comics that are based on, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll say patriotic type situations or characters or whatever are probably not going to do as well because I mean any story is going to paint its hero as the hero right. and so any story with a blatantly patriotic American character it's just not going to fly all that well and so ultimately it's all about the overall perception from different standpoints obviously but it's yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of variables there i would not want to be the guy to decide okay we're going to sell this book in northern africa for example i mean it just wouldn't go or we're going to try to sell this book in the middle east that's wow that would just be really really weird i think the latest print that was not necessarily was taking on, but was facing up to uh, some U.S. problems was right after 9-11. There were some prints run, whether it be covers or storylines themselves. Those, a lot of those faced the, the problem at the time. If I recall, the Spider-Man movie poster was changed because at first was he not posed on the World Trade Center? Yeah, I believe I believe you're correct. And so at that time, the the U.S. reaction was to make sure that in that case the World Trade Center was not pictured. There were also books that came out or or illustrated novels that had stories about the survival and some of the aftermath. The years ago, they had the comics for the world hunger situation and those not directly, but they did depict the fact that warlords were hoarding the uh, supplies that were shipped to the general public. And of course, the warlords were distributing uh, those goods among their people and let the rest of the world starve. But at, uh, what I recall, at no time did anybody just come up and say, we're going to fight the war, or we're going to fight terrorists. It was not accepted then, and it is not accepted now. It's almost a fact of, if you do that, then they have succeeded in what they wanted to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, and... Kind of the other side of that, I think, or another side of it, is it's one of those things that you want to draw attention. The whole point of it is to draw attention to that sort of plight. Um, But you really kind of have to be careful as a publisher to not get too close to reality. I mean, you want it to be obvious, sort of, that 
this is the kind of thing that is going on. And I mean, you're not going to, well, you might say that it's going on if it's really not, but likely you're getting, if you're trying to make it realistic, then you're getting reports one way or another that these kinds of things are happening. And you want to draw attention to that so that it can be changed, but you're publishing a book. You're not the one actually executing the change. So you're really just trying to draw attention to it, to the problem. And so you're wanting to lay out the problem in a way that is at least similar to the real problem without kind of getting close enough to name names because that gets dangerous. And so, yeah, it's a very fine line. It's a very fine line that you're dancing on at that point. So it's it's tricky. I mean, and to, to do that with a... a, a an isolated tragedy is tough and usually will generate a good bit of sympathy and and it'll do that in a way that 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 kind of thing is is more of a coping mechanism Um, and and ultimately it's it's all really a coping mechanism you're just trying to kind of get by in the world and and do as much as you can for as many people as you can and so ultimately it all works out as kind of a coping mechanism it's just sometimes you have to be more careful than, than others, and sometimes you don't. You're, you're not wanting to get too specific for for varying reasons, either because you don't want to get yourself in trouble or because you don't want to draw too much attention to something specific. I'm not sure that makes sense either, but. Well, you are walking a fine line. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, I am actually walking a fine line trying to describe what I'm trying to describe and it's not that I'm relating myself to that but you know I think you've succeeded though I know what you're saying and I agree with you could patriotic characters do well here facing the, a similar similar circumstances patriotic I mean from other yeah, countries. from other countries. It's, it's say, you know, because I mean, we've we've I've already talked about, we've already mentioned Captain Britain and and and, and Captain Canuck. I think we mentioned Captain Britain, right? Uh, so, either, well, we've mentioned if him not, before. Okay. I don't think we've mentioned him tonight, but if we didn't mention him tonight, well, he's been mentioned now. Yep. I mean, something like Captain Canuck has had some success here. Do you think those type of patriotic characters from another country? would face the same issues that one from here, such as Captain America, which which has been our, is, like you said, is the most obvious uh, example. Yeah. I, I, for one, I don't see why not. Um, it Again, it depends on kind of what's, what's the motivation that's making that character patriotic. I mean, is... Again, if if the idea is Captain France showing up and kicking Captain America's butt, then no, that's probably not going to fly real, unless there's a really damn good story behind it. But, I mean, for the most part, these days, the patriotic aspect is really as much a character point, or more of a character point, than it is a plot point. I mean it can be used in ways that isn't going to drive the story towards something that might be offensive because it's really, I mean, look at, I mean, again, Captain America, um, the winter soldier film. Um, and the way you've got Captain America, who's a very patriotic character, but that's, He's not really that patriotic in that movie, but there's a lot, and and, and there's story, there's stuff from the film that that, or there's there's stuff from that story that didn't make it into the film that probably make it more so, at least to my understanding. But you've got this character, this hero, this superhero, who's dealing with all of this stuff. And he happens to be a patriotic character, but it doesn't really affect the story that much. 
I mean, it does a bit, but kind of only at the beginning. And there's a point at which he just sort of has to, he kind of has to stop being the patriotic character for a little while. And he consciously chooses to do that. And so it's only part of the story in that it's a turning point for him kind of in the story and kind of in his personality a little bit. I mean, he has to actively choose to stop. So, and it's a thing for, it's a difficult thing for him. He doesn't quite know how to do it at first. Um, which it's funny that it takes a Russian to help him do it, but she, uh, how Russian she is is debatable at times. But so, but that that's really, like I said, just kind of the beginning of the story. It, it continues on from there. And I mean, the meat of the story is, is later. So I don't know. I mean, it, it, I, I don't think it's a requirement that it be, I don't think, I don't think there's any need for it to be awkward. I mean, honestly, I, I would think it would be interesting to have a Captain America in a movie where he's not working against a patriotic character from another country, but to have them in the same movie, I mean, it could have, it could make for some interesting character interplay, you know? Yeah. I don't think that would be a bad thing at all. If Captain France was brought to as a uh, character in a comic. I can see it being accepted following specifics. One, I'm sorry to say, an independent comic would not really be accepted. Captain Canuck is has been around long enough. It's he's a character from I want to say the early nineties, late eighties. So he has been accepted. If the big two, if one of the big two took Captain France and made him one of their characters with his own title, with his mannerisms, his uh, style as a hero. His Frenchness. His Frenchness uh, shining. I think that it would be accepted if this person was created and ended up fighting someone else in that group. If uh, Captain France was to fight Batman, it would be accepted. If Captain France has his own title and he's already established the fact that he is a hero and he has the French values. If it was just Captain France comes in to Detective Comics and fights Batman, he's he's no matter what his ideas are, if he's not pre-established, he's not going to be accepted. Same way if he fought Captain America, he would have to have his own title, and then he would fight Captain America, which happens in all of Marvel titles. Somebody fights somebody else, good guy versus good guy, until they get to the point where they say, hey, we need to fight that guy because he's forcing us to fight. But what I'm saying is Captain France would have to be established. And who knows? It could be by cartoon. It could be in, be in a movie. But he can't just step in and start fighting someone. He would, to me, he would have to have backstory. He would have to show that he's a patriot to France, and that's why he is appearing in one his own book, two a cartoon or a movie, and three that's why he's fighting somebody from that uh, universe. I, I just feel like you would have to make sure that that person is known, and let's go. You know, let's shoot from there. Yeah, I agree. It would make it a whole lot easier if you could establish him before introducing him, like into the Marvel universe or into the the Avengers group, the whatever you want to call that, mm-hmm. where where Cap is, where Captain America is, that bunch he runs with. Um, it would make it a whole lot easier if you could establish that character first. He would at least not 
give the impression of being a villain. It would, I mean, to you, to establish him as a hero. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just bringing somebody in for Cap to fight, and oh, it turns out he's a good guy. Well, okay. Well, that's not much of a story that way. So yeah, I'm I'm with you there. And I think that kind of, I think where we're getting back to Tom's kind of question is, I think the 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 inverse of that works as well. If you're doing this, if you want to bring Captain America into if Marvel decides to introduce Captain America into kind of a shared universe of French comics, then you almost have to do the same thing. You want to, you want to, you want it to be with an established character within that universe. You don't want to create somebody new to show up and, and start having Captain America kick their butt because then it just seems like he's just showing up and picking on people. It, it seems more bullying that way. I think. I agree. Yeah. I do too. And bullying's not good. It's wrong. It is. It sucks. And the U.S. is trying to live that down as it is. Oh boy. Ain't we though. What do you think, Thomas? You're the one that brought up the question. Come on. <laughs> I... I I, I I agree with what y'all are saying. This I'm not sure why they don't try that. I don't, I'm not sure why there's not more international characters in the, uh, being introduced, even if they're not patriotic characters. Uh, I know I'm expanding the, the conversation a little bit. That's okay. At a time when your audience is screaming for more diversity and things like that, that you, you can't inter, add in, international characters. I would think that's that's part of diversity. Am I, am I wrong? I'm pretty sure that's kind of what that means, yeah. Okay. It's at least an element of it. I mean, it, it may not be exactly what some people may be asking for, but it, it, it does just, you know. I, I don't know. It seems to me like it would be a step in the right direction. Definitely. You know, I mean, the juggling act we have with the whole diversity thing right now is that we're torn between wanting to change existing characters and create new ones. Because creating new characters doesn't always stick. Right. But changing existing characters sometimes pisses off your audience. It does. I and I was back. That's ahead. that's kind of the ba- that's kind of the, the juggling act that that ever that all the all the publishers really are caught finding themselves caught in right now is that it it's, I mean there's a big potential for failure either way and that's that's not what the business aspect of it wants to deal with and that's why the big that's why the publishers are so slow to do some of that stuff. Because it, honestly, no shit can hurt the bottom line. I mean, if you, again, picking on Marvel a little bit, if you make Thor female in order to have a, another female character out there, well, some Thor fans are not going to like that idea. Right. It's just not going to work for everybody. I mean, there are going to be stories of any kind that aren't going to work for everybody, but... It's it's a drastic change, and in in that character specifically, and people are gonna stop buying Thor comics because of it. And I mean, the other side of that is you're creating if you're gonna create a new female character, you know, maybe not everybody's gonna love that new female character, and so they're not gonna buy those books. And so you've you've spent all this time, effort, and money creating this thing that looks on the surface at least and is probably also more deeply an honest effort at creating more diversity in comics and it fails so you're kind of hosed either way yeah uh, I, I understand what you're saying and what do you mean there's been several times I've thought about we should discuss the whole diversity and comics, but I just knew that 
that would be a long talk, and I don't, it, I don't think we would get anywhere. Uh, you're right. You know, in in regards to taking an established character or established, in this case, it would be a code name or costume, whatever, and give it to someone that's not like the present holder. And in in your case, you said Thor. You know. Jane Foster gets the hammer. She becomes Thor. Or this is not even, you know, you've said it a couple times. I'm going to say it again. We're just using Marvel as an example. We're not bashing them. Sam Wilson becomes Captain America. And, and the response is, well, why, why don't they just create a new character? Well, the thing is, is first of all, it's a new character. And yet this, there's usually not a lot of support for a new character. Why? Because it's not a known quantity. With a Captain America or a Thor, you have an already you already have an idea, and you have an established name, and now you've you've done something different with it. And I'm a big believer in legacy. I dig legacy, and and to the degree I I think those were legacies. Would I love to see the originals come back? Yeah. Do I have a major problems with the replacements? No. They may or may not be my cup of tea, but, hey, there's people out there that support them. And, you know, awesome. That's great. Yeah, it kind of amazes me how much of the comics industry, and this one it really is kind of staring right down the barrel of the big two. Um, it, impre- it amazes me how much of the comics industry is based on the concept of nostalgia and because you start screwing around with people's characters that have been around for decades and some of them get downright pissy about it oh yeah hostile i mean to to the point of death threats threats on social media yeah and it's just i'm like wow really i mean sure you love your character and all but Dude, people change, you know? Things change. Yeah. The world changes. The world is changing. Yes. Move on. I mean, that's what trade... That's what... That's why... You, I mean, you bought all those damn books in the first place. If you want to read about those that character, crack those old books out and read those. Mm-hmm. Go buy the trades and collections and all that shit. I mean, there's ways to support that. I mean... Ugh, and let... Let the new guy come in and, and do their thing. And let the publisher make a new generation of readers happy. And freaking get over yourself to an extent, you know? I don't know. I, I almost feel like I'm ranting now. But <laughs> it's just, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with nostalgia until it starts, until it starts threatening to kill people. To be honest, yeah, and that's just that's that's too far. That's too much. I mean, that's you, if if you're if you if you've ever I'll I'll say this, and if you guys want to disclaim me, go for it. If you've ever threatened to kill somebody over a character in a book, you're wrong. <laughs> Plain and simple, you messed up. You went too far. And yet we've seen that all the time. We see it all the time. All the time. There's that's there's help available for that sort of thing. Yeah, if you don't like what is being done with a certain character or a certain book, here's the thing you can do: stop buying the book. Vote with your dollars. Yes, you know, you as the public, stop buying those books. Then retailers stop ordering as many copies of that book. And then that's when the publishers go, get the hint and go, oh, okay, well, maybe we need to do something. To threaten to take someone's life over a choice of story path, just because you don't like it, that's incredibly fucked up. It blows my mind to think that someone does that. You don't have to like the story idea. First of all, read it. Read a story. Then get back to me whether you like it or not. 
don't just say, well, I don't like that idea because it's something that's been announced through social media or whatever months in advance before the book even comes out. Or if they do it, in this case, we're talking about changing characters or, or whatever. It is so mind-boggling to get on social media and that's all I see is, you know, so-and-so publisher is doing this and then it's 50 to 100 comments underneath going, oh my God, what are they doing? They're just totally screwing it up and I'm like, you haven't read a word yet. It could be horrible. It could be the best thing ever. You don't know. And that's what... I know Mikey's not a big fan of social media, and there's times where, especially something like this, I'm really not a fan of it, because it just... It just it, and it got, kind of goes back to your comment a couple of minutes ago, Mike. It's nostalgia. It's... They don't like change. Mm -hmm. This is the way it's done. That's the way it's supposed to be. But the problem is there, if they keep going that same path, you're going to start seeing the comments going, ah, it's the same thing over and over again. Why don't they do something new? And then they'll do something new. Go, oh, my God, they're doing something new. Oh, God, what the hell are they doing? It, yeah. It, it's, you're, it, yeah you're, it's really hard to make everybody happy in that regard. And right. So, and, they, and, you know, they're publishers. They're out to make money. You kind of have to not fault them for that because if they don't change some stuff here and there, they're never, ever going to bring in any new readers. And that's that's what they're about. I mean, they've, they've got to bring in new readers or they're going to or they're going to shrivel and die. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, yes, that is from a strictly financial point of view. At least they're making the effort to try to make it interesting when they do it, you know? Give them a little credit for that, and just sit back and enjoy the damn story. It's a story, after all. It's made-up bullshit in its purest form, done completely made up and 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 processed for your entertainment. It, try to be entertained, please. You know, instead of all this other silliness. It's just I don't know. It seems like we're also try to look at it that it's written. For you, when you were younger, it's not going to take on big political views. Hence the reason that patriots do not go fight in wars and since, uh, what, the uh, Second World War comics, and that includes the DC war line which they had, what, five or six titles. Mm -hmm. Because when the Vietnam War came, that almost put war comics out of business. Oh, yeah. Nobody wanted to touch that. No. It was way too controversial. And, like, then, now, uh, patriotic characters do not go fight in areas that are touch and go as it is. You don't want to rile up anybody. So you just try to work it so you you lay low and know that you're not going to rankle anyone. Right. In a sense, you're kind of dialing back the politics a little bit because especially in this day of, of polarization on a political level, you're going to, you can be absolutely freaking certain you're going to piss off half of your readership one way or the other. So the easier thing to do, the, the better, the smarter thing to do is just back away from it. But don't, don't, don't go there. Just let, just do focus on the, the made up bad guys we already have. Don't worry about the real ones. Cause that's, that's, that's bad juju right there. That's bad bottom line stuff. You can't, you can't win that fight. Very true. All righty. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap things up and move on? 
<laughs> you don't think we've done enough damage here? Jeez. <laughs> I think I think so. That's why I'm trying to say cut. <laughs> why well, I'm like, let's get out while the getting's good. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. Let's let's brought it right back to patriotism, and and yeah, we're gonna ride that wave out of here, sure. Mm-hmm. All righty. I guess on that note, we'll take a quick break and be back with weekly picks. And we are back. It is time for our weekly picks. And leading off is Mike. Yep, me first. Me first. Um, uh, my first pick is a Valiant book. It is entitled Bloodshot's Day Off. This is number one. We have, if, you, and if you're not familiar with what went on in the last arc of Bloodshot, Bloodshot discovered that he's not the only Bloodshot. There are there were a group of others that he got dumped in with. And for this arc, I mean, more stuff than that went on in that arc, and you should check it out because it's pretty good. But in this arc, um, two of those other bloodshots um, take off on a vacation because they haven't had a vacation in a long time. They've been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting for years, really, as far as anybody could tell. So these guys are in New York City, and they're going to check out what's going on in New York City. And I can't imagine that there won't be some sort of weirdness going on that they run into. So I think I don't think it's any secret um, for our regular listeners that I like the bloodshot stuff. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. I think it'll be fun. Now, are they going to be caught between the moon and New York City? <laughs> Uh, I know it's crazy, but it's true. The, the, uh, <laughs> Good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <sighs> We've also got kind of a new creative team on this, so I think it'll be fun to see how they do. Yeah, it'd be interesting uh, with, a, with a new voice. Yep. The bloodshot. Awesome. All righty, uh, Les, you are next. My first choice is from Dynamite Entertainment. It is Green Hornet 66 meets the Spirit. This is number one of five. Here you've got two characters that I've always enjoyed. And in this one, Britt Reed the owner and publisher of the Daily Sentinel and his accomplice, Cato, travel to Central City, uh uh-huh, where the spirit is, and to uh, participate in the World's Fair there. The main attraction for them is the device known as the Newspaper of Tomorrow, which is kind of unusual because it's a device capable of predicting headlines before events happen. This reminds me of the television series, and I'm sorry, I cannot remember the name of it. I think it's called... But it's where the new... I'm sorry? I think it was called Early Edition. Yes. I think you're right, yes. (laughs) Where the the newspaper would come out and tell you what's going to happen that day. So... In this one, I'm, I'm ready to uh, see what the Green Hornet is doing there because he does cross paths with the spirit, which they note as a uh, skulker in the shadows. I am definitely set for this one, and it should be a lot of fun to read. It's by Fred Van Lint, Bob Q, and Mike Allred. Check it out. Sounds sounds like a cool twist on it. A cool way to yep. get those two together. Yep. Alrighty, I am up next. And for my first choice, I'm going with IDW Publishing's Time and Vine number one. This is written by uh, a favorite of Les and Mine's, uh, Tom Zare. Uh, if you're not familiar with his work, he wrote and drew Love and Capes, which was a great series. 
obviously it's a romance book and it dealt with superheroes, but it wasn't really a superhero book. It just happened to be a book with a superhero. And then he followed that up with uh, Long Distance, which was a a short little mini series. And and now he's doing this one, which is regarding a winery that um, if you drink a certain vintage of wine, it takes you, it basically takes you back to the year. So if you have a, I don't know, what, a 1876 vintage or something like that. I don't know if they're that old. Who knows? Just just for discussion purposes. Uh, you sip that, and then next thing you know, you're, you have traveled in the past to there, there. I've read a little bit of the a little preview of this. I think he previewed it on his website. And it looks good. I'm a Real big fan of his writing, and I love his art, and I think he's got another winner here with uh, Time and Vine. Yeah, you say that, and I think I remember seeing a preview of this, too. And yeah, he's he's done some stuff that, even since Love and Capes, that has been really, really compelling. The Long Distance was, was, it was a great piece of drama, but the, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting I don't know was if it was picked up, but it seemed like the scenes and I, and for for the life of me I can't remember the characters' names, but all the scenes that was with the male lead were colored in a certain tint, and then hers would be in a different tint, and then if I'm not mistaken, when they were together, it was like a third different color, and I thought that was a pretty ingenious move to do that and his art is a little car it's cartoony but it's great it's beautiful it's awesome i, I yeah. dig the heck out of it yeah my my deal with that series was i that was one that i really didn't expect to like but it was honestly the for me it was the dialogue yes the dialogue just it just was so good it was just so smooth and so witty and so funny at times and it's just, yeah, it just hit me. I mean, yeah, and I really liked it. So, yeah, I, um, I, I want to check this one out, too. Yeah, I think this is this is going to be a winner. But I'm saying that with a little bit of a bias. Well, who knows? <laughs> uh, just a smidgen. Yes. Uh, Mikey, you are up next. All right. Well, from, from, from that, I'm going to take a bit of a turn. My second pick is a dynamite book, and it is... Ash versus the Army of Darkness, number one. This appears to be a pretty much a direct sequel to the movie Army of Darkness. Um, it, it picks up right after the closing scene of that movie, or the the Zero Issue did anyway. I mean, basically the Zero Issue put Ash right in the manager's office at S-Mart after the shooting. <laughs> and that was fun. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, this this is going to be the story of Ash figuring out that the Deadites have essentially followed him or found a way or are finding ways to break into our world. And the, the first place that he's going to go to try to stop it is high school. Woo-hoo. So... Yeah, if you can imagine the Ash from Army of Darkness, the movie, as a substitute teacher in a high school, then I think you may have a pretty good idea where this story's going to go. And that just sounds amusing as hell to me. Should be groovy. Mm -hmm. And to think that you're going to have Bruce Campbell's voice going through your mind as lines are given. Always do, reading these things. (laughs) Yes. Kind of hard not to. Mm-hmm. All righty, Les. My second choice is a number one issue also from Red 5 Comics. Scott Chitwood and Rob Thornton bring you After Eden. I'm going to just read this because I thought it was phenomenal. 
They are alone on an uninhabited planet with no survival skills. Supernatural forces torment their every move. Their relation has been destroyed. They are Adam and Eve, and the fate of the human race not only depends on them surviving, but falling in love again. I, I think this is going to be a phenomenal idea to represent Adam and Eve in a different Garden of Eden mm -hmm. and see what transpires. It is a four-issue series, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to this one. It does sound pretty cool. That that description, yeah, that's interesting. Alrighty, for my second choice, I am going uh, with Boom Studios, and this is called Sisters of Sorrow. And this is also their first issue, uh, written by Kirk Sutter, with art by Courtney. Alameda. I'm sure I picture that. I seem to do that a lot. This is a story about four women who run a nonprofit women's shelter. And what they have decided to do is to basically become vigilantes. So at night, they dress up in nuns' habits and take out to the streets and go after abusers who may have gotten off free or or whatever. And in doing this, they've been given the nickname the Sisters of Sorrow. Sounds like a kind of cool concept. We'll see how it goes, but I'm I'm definitely interested in this book. Vigilante nuns. There you go. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of fun. Alrighty, I believe we all have uh, honorable mentions this week, too. Uh-huh. Okay, Mikey. So I'm first. All right, so my, and I'll keep this brief, because um, this is actually a reprint, um, but it is a reprint of um, an Action Lab Danger Zone title, and it's one that we've talked about a bit before. This is called Zombie Tramp Origins, number one. Um, and this is essentially the reprint of the original first arc of the Zombie Tramp series. And this has proven to be, this is, this, for me, this has become a very cool supernatural horror title um, with, a, with a liberal dash of humor thrown in. Um, the fact that it's still almost as cheesecakey as it was at the beginning. Um, is all right. I'm fine with that. Whatever. Not a big deal for me, but you know. So I'm, I, I don't remember if I picked it up this early on at the very beginning. So I'm kind of curious to see what it was like back then, how it started. So I'm going to check it out. Um, it is interesting that they've gone this path. I mean, most publishers would just go back and, and collect the story arc as a trade and, and then be, that would be it. But for them to, to go back and reprint it as a floppy again, is kind of interesting. It's, 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 it's an interesting move. I mean, it's not something that's been done in, uh, I can't remember the last time. It was, I, I remember it was done a lot when I was growing up, especially with the big two doing that kind of stuff uh, yeah, most prominently is Marvel Tales which would reprint a lot of the older Spider-Man stories so I, hey it's cool I mean if that opens it up to new readers that way and then they can and they can get this and then oh, oh there's actually a regular series too so I can jump on that too so hey awesome more power to them hope it does well all right, Les. I am going to get another number one in this group. From Aftershock Comics comes Unholy Grail, number one. Written by Colin Dunn. Art by Mirko Kolak. 
this is a Lovecraftian look at the legend of King Arthur. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to strip away the sweetness of the uh, Arthurian legends to show that he had a, a bloody rise to power and was uh, serving a, a, what they call an unholy reign. So this is a different look, just as After Eden was, of a prominent figure and we'll see which direction they take it. But I got a feeling with Colin Bunn, you are not going to get uh, sunshine and lollipops. Uh, this this should be a great read. Yeah, when I first heard this announced, I, I immediately thought of Mike, and I'm like, oh, he's going to love this. Oh, yeah, I'm on board. <laughs> We discussed that just a little while ago, did we not? Do we did. <laughs> and of course, it's our friend, Colin Ben, writing. Mm-hmm. Yes. We need to have him on again so we can talk about this book. Very cool. Alrighty, uh, I guess it is my turn. So, my honorable mention, I'm going back to IDW Publishing. And it is their latest artist edition. And if you're not familiar with that is, it is what the, what they've done is they've collected the original art of usually several books that are done by a particular, mo- in most cases it's been artists. I think there's been one that may be a little bit more uh, either story or writer focused. But in this case, it's Jack Kirby. And what they've done is They've scanned in the original artwork, and they've printed and, and they've produced books in the size of the original artwork, which I believe is 11 by 18, if I'm not mistaken. And this is a fa- called Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four: World's Greatest Artists, or Fantastic Four: World's Greatest. I apologize. And this includes issues 33, 45, 47, and 60. And a lot of these issues focus on the Inhumans. These are appearances by the Inhumans, if I'm not mistaken, which, of course, the timing is, I'm sure it's intentional with with an upcoming uh, TV show and uh, with Marvel been focusing on the Inhumans in the books for a couple of years. And obviously we are two months, believe it or not, away from uh, Jack Kirby's 100th birthday or what would have been his 100th birthday. So these are a little pricey, but they are definitely worth it. I've got his, uh, his edition of Commandy and I know Les was there when I, got my copy and started looking at it in the, just the splash page. It just like that was worth, that was worth the money. So it's, it's really cool to go back and look at these pieces and you see where there's been some white out or maybe some notes saying this needs to be changed. You see where the tape was. I mean, it's, it's, it's all there. It's, it's really kind of cool just to see a process that you don't, you really don't see in, in making a comic. All righty. Any special mentions this week? Um, nothing springing to mind. Okay. Well, let's do our regular shout outs then. First off, want to, uh, say thank you to Manny the Martyr for the, uh, really cool music for our podcast. Great musicians. Uh, you should really check out their site. We'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, you can also go to our podcast page on www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net, and we have a link to their page 
Uh, you, you just look for the, the Manny logo and click on it, and there you go. So we thank them very much. I also want to thank the really awesome men and women of the Potter and family on Twitter for their support, for spreading the word of the fellowship. If you're looking for a podcast, anything, I'm sure it is out there. All you got to do is go to Twitter and do a search, hashtag Potter and family, and the options are endless. We really thank them for spreading our, our message, and we've been doing our best to return that love. So thank you guys very, very much. And then finally, you, dear listener, thank you for downloading this episode and, and checking us out. Uh, thank you for listening to our previous episodes. It's very much appreciated. We are always interested in what you have to say. If you got a comment, question, suggestion, anything, want to call us out on something, we're always open. We're always interested in hearing what you have to say. And there are several ways you can do that. First off, you can just send us an email. Email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net or you can go to our website, click on our About Us tab, and there's a form there that you can fill out. And we'll respond to you as quickly as possible. Of course, we're on social media. We have did a lot of talking about that on this episode. We are on Facebook, The Fellowship of the Geeks. Feel free to like us there and shoot us a message if you like. We're obviously on Twitter, at Fellowship Geeks. Feel free to follow us there and shoot us a message if you are so inclined. Uh, Mikey has a personal Twitter account at Mikey Geek. I have one as well at Tom TC Geek. Feel free to follow us and say hi or something, and we'll respond in kind. And wherever you download or check out this episode or prior episodes, whether it's through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or YouTube, it would be much appreciated if you would rate us. Whether it's the thumbs up, thumbs down, stars, or whatever format they use, any sort of rating would be appreciated. And if you have a couple extra minutes, do a review, please. It would be, once again, very much appreciated. Did I miss anything? Uh, question: Do we have a question of the week, or are we taking a week off on the question of the week? <laughs> um, well, it's difficult with this one to go with the obvious. Right. So instead of going with the obvious, because who's, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head how how, how our international listeners break down, if we have any. Um, but right. instead of going that route, let's go with what is your favorite major character that has gotten changed in the last few years? Okay, we can do that. That's fine. And speaking of questions, we are accepting questions for an upcoming Q&A episode. Uh, we will remind you through social media as well. So shoot us any question you'd like us to answer through the uh, aforementioned methods. And if we like if we like it, we will use it. And of course, obviously, give you a shout out for sending us that question so please send them our way and who knows we may use your question and it may be stumped who knows (laughs) yeah stump us well i'm not calling out for something but (laughs) any final thoughts before you wrap it up tonight no just thanks everybody i too thank everyone and hope to uh, hear from you soon Thank you for listening, everybody. It's much appreciated. Uh, We love you guys. Uh, Once again, those who do celebrate it, happy 4th of July, and we'll catch you on the other side. Until then, read more comics and support your local stores. We thank you for listening to the show. Comments, 
suggestions, and questions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks and on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Until next time, 